In our recent video, we checked out the first Intel Celeron processor. It runs at only 266 MHz and the performance in the games shown was quite average. It eventually got the thumbs down because it was just too slow. Intel removed all the level 2 cache on the CPU. So I thought, let's make a video upgrading the CPU to the best option available in 1998, which is this one here, the Intel Pentium 2 running at 450 megahertz. That was the flagship model at the time. Comparing these two processors, well, the clock speed is different, of course, 266 compared to 450, but there are other differences. The front side bus, 66 megahertz on the Celeron compared to 100 on the Pentium 2. So that, that makes already a huge difference. And then we've got the issue of level two cache. The Pentium 2 has 512 kilobytes of level two cache. It does run at half the clock speed. Um, it's just the design of this Pentium 2, but the Celeron has no level two cache whatsoever, none, zero. And this is the main reason why this processor performs so poorly. Here we have the test system. It's a slot one main board from AOpen, model number AX6BC. I've been using this main board on many past projects, really beautiful, with the famous Intel 440BX chipset. Two ISA slots, that's awesome for DOS gaming, for those sound cards, five PCI slots, HEP, three SD RAM slots, we've got a module, crucial 256 megabytes, that's about perfect for Windows 98. We have two ID ports, the floppy port is in a little bit unfortunate spot, and here is the Celeron 266. We are using the ATI Radeon 9250 LE, I like using this card, it has DVI, so that makes my life easy for capturing. It is compatible with old and the newer HEP standards. It supports 16x AF for sharper textures in the games. And the game we are checking out today, it will not render correctly on a GeForce card. That's also another reason why we're using a Radeon. My favorite sound card for Windows 98, the Sound Blaster Live. For storage, we're using the GoTek USB floppy drive emulator, and then I have a 32 gigabyte SATA SSD together with the StarTech ID to SATA converter. In the BIOS, I like to load the Turbo defaults. That gives us excellent performance. Stay away from the load setup defaults. That gives us like a fail-safe uh, environment with very basic performance. Every bias is a little bit different, but I like to go into the integrated uh, onboard devices and disable resources that we don't need. For example, we don't need the serial ports and we don't need the parallel ports. That frees up some, some interrupts that we can use for sound cards, for example. On a lot of older main boards, there's one setting that's quite important if you're using a USB keyboard and mouse. Look for USB keyboard and USB mouse support that needs to be enabled, otherwise with a USB keyboard you will not have any input under MS-DOS. On the topic of USB input devices, sometimes after installing the chipset drivers, your USB devices are not gonna work. So it's very handy to have a PS2 keyboard or mouse ready to go, especially in the beginning when you're setting up Windows and all the drivers, just leave it plugged in. Uh, worst case, if the USB devices don't function, you can still use the PS2 input devices. Let's dive into the benchmarks. We have GL Quake and we can see, wow, what a difference. So with the Celeron, we would get around 40 FPS uh, across all the resolutions, but the Pentium 2, so much better. It manages to go over 100 FPS and in terms of how much faster it is, it's around 2.5 times faster compared to the Celeron. In incoming, we can see the same picture with the Celeron achieving, yeah, 27 FPS across all the resolutions, but the Pentium 2 is much stronger. We're getting 64.8, 66, and 67.8 FPS. DOS performance is also greatly improved. We can see here the performance in 3D Bench and Chris's 3D Benchmark. And here another slide with the performance boost in the PC Player Benchmark. Doom and Quake. And now let's play some games. In the video about the Celeron processor, I really enjoyed my time playing Incoming. So let's test it out again. Performance this time is very solid. Uh, we have the 
frame cap enabled in the options. I would recommend that otherwise if you're playing the game with unlocked frame rate it will be running too fast. So I couldn't detect any slowdowns. The performance seems to be very consistent. We're playing at 800 by 600. Now the game I found it to get a little bit hard around the third scenario. So yeah I found some cheats. You enter uh, a cheat code and then you can go into the options and configure uh, what sort of cheats you want like unlimited unlimited ammo, uh, infinite health um, uh, or not being destructible and that made life easier. Here we are in the third scenario we are above water and we need to defend oil rigs and there are some icebergs and enemy submarines. Yeah really nice graphics the gameplay is very smooth but I ran into some sort of a bug um, in phase six of the third scenario, the game seems to be stuck. Uh, I basically, I destroyed all the enemies, but the game just simply doesn't continue. I'm not sure if that is related to the cheat codes that I used. Maybe there was some trigger that didn't happen. Not quite sure. Um, yeah, if you know, <laughs> if you have any recommendations, let me know. But yeah, this is definitely a game I can recommend to you. Now, the, uh, the way you can get the game, digital releases, Steam, GOG and the Zoom platform. The Zoom platform release is the best one. It has all, uh, all three games including the expansion that the other digital releases don't have and all of them have the uh, second incoming game as well. You install it on a modern machine, copy the files across. With the uh, Zoom platform release it uses uh, DG Voodoo 2 which is a wrapper so you need to delete uh, some DLL files to make it work natively but then you are up and running. You also need to create a shortcut with a parameter to change the resolution. I will put details down below in the video description about that but that game definitely gets the thumbs up, highly recommended. Had a blast and also you want to have a decent joystick to really enjoy it. I'm using the Thrustmaster 16000M. And I played some more of Total Annihilation, beautiful game. So here, just a tip, the digital releases, they didn't really work out for me. So basically what I did, I purchased the game on GOG, so I own it. And then you can get the disc images from archive.org. Because this game, just like incoming, it uses CD audio tracks for the background music. And yeah, it's nice to have, the music is pretty good. I Played some more, I think I'm in the uh, fifth mission where I have to liberate a uh, gate, it's called a galactic gate from the core faction and the game runs a lot better, much faster. However, once you have a big army and you try to steamroll the enemy and there's lots of fighting going on, the performance still suffers. It becomes quite choppy but it's much better compared to the Celeron. The audio issues, they're still persistent. Um, what, ha what is happening? is not all sound effects are being played. It's as if the game is holding back uh, the number of sounds being played at the same time to maybe preserve performance. I'm not quite sure. I haven't had that issue on a faster machine so I'm still not 100% sure what's going on. In terms of yeah the game I'm really enjoying it. I wasn't at first I wasn't sure how to liberate the galactic gate. First I destroyed it and that it, it I lost the mission. You basically have to use the commander to liberate the gate and then the game still wouldn't, the, the level wouldn't finish. I wasn't quite sure and it turned out there were two missing buildings somewhere else on the map that haven't been discovered yet. So I had to search the map, destroy those buildings and then the mission completed. And yeah, next level is mission number six. So looking forward to playing some more of this game. So the Pentium 2 450 is a much more capable processor. In the benchmarks it scores around two and a half times better in terms of the FPS. So that's a huge difference. And it's a combination of many factors. The higher frontside bus, the higher clock speed and of course 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache. This processor because it is the flagship model of the Pentium 2 will not be that easy to find on the used market. It's, uh, it will definitely uh, attract a premium. It's a collector's item, so just be aware. You might be better off looking for a 400 megahertz version instead.
The games we tested, they were running a lot better. Incoming especially, I would say it's running at a consistent frame rate without any slowdowns. On the Celeron, that game was all over the place. It was still playable um, because if it's running slow, it's similar to Wing Commander. Uh, if it runs slow, it's actually quite easy to aim. Uh, that's not the case on the Pentium 2. So the, 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 the pace of the game is a little bit faster, more fluid uh, and smoother. In total annihilation, at the beginning, everything was silky smooth, just like on a modern computer. But even the Pentium 2 450, once you have uh, built up an army and you try to steamroll the enemy with all your units selected, then the performance will go down. And partly to do because I'm running at 1080p, and that's quite unusual for a setup at the time. Maybe you had a 1280 by 1024 monitor maximum, but most people would probably play at 1024 by 768 or something like that. So that might be the reason um, because it's displaying more units on the screen at the same time. So maybe it's a little bit unfair to throw this sort of a, a task on to the Pentium 2. DOS performance is also much stronger. Having said that, the Celeron 266 is perfectly capable for DOS games, including 3D DOS games, maybe not for high resolution. So if you wanna play um, Tomb Raider or System Shock at 640x480. I would say the Celeron might struggle a little bit. It should be fairly smooth, but not silky smooth. And here, having the faster Pentium 2 again will make a big difference. So all in all, the Pentium 2 450 gets a big thumbs up. A very capable retro processor for building an awesome DOS Windows 98 retro gaming PC. Don't play games that are too modern, like once you go into the year 2000, 2001, this one will struggle. You want to have like a 1 gigahertz or even uh, higher. But for games around 1996, 1997, 1998, those sort of games, they will run absolutely beautiful on this machine. And with the slot 1 platform, you get all the other benefits, with the highlight being you get ICA slots, so you can use really nice DOS compatible sound cards. There you have it, we looked at 1998, comparing the worst slot one processor, the Celeron 266 with the flagship Pentium 2, running at 450 megahertz, and the difference was absolutely amazing. It's quite a contrast to what you see on the current market. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment down below. What is your opinion about the slot one platform? What is your favorite processor? And any suggestions, please leave them down below as well. Give it a thumbs up, share the video with your friends and do subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I shall see you soon with another one.